We're here doing the Quinn Mikulski method with um, our truth table. You can see it here. Numbered the rows right here. And the first step is to count how many ones. So in this row, there's no ones. In this row, there's a one here, so that's why there's a one. There's a one here, that's why there's a one. There's, there's two ones here, that's why there's two. There's one right here and so on. So the only row that has fours down here, and there's a bunch of threes and some twos. Now I want to compare the rows. I only want to compare rows where the output is a one or don't care. So if a row has a zero in it, I don't compare it with anything. And then there has to be just a one bit change. Comparing a zero with a one is never going to work because the zero has a, has an output of a zero. Comparing the ones with a two is possible, but all the ones seem to have zero as an output. So we start our comparison by comparing twos with threes. So we're going to compare this row right here with the threes. So first we're going to compare it with this row. And that works because there's a one bit change. So 3 can be compared to 7. 3 can be compared to 7. And the result is w bar, x doesn't matter, y and z. Now we're expressing that two ways. This is the traditional way w bar, y and z. But what we want to do is begin thinking of it like this. Zeros because it's a W bar. Dash because the X doesn't care. And then 1, 1 because of these ones right here. Okay, now I want to compare row 3 here. This row with a 2 in it with another 3. So here's a 3, here's another 3. Okay. So this is good because there's only a one bit change. W doesn't care in this case. So there's the don't care for the W. X is a zero and Y and Z are both ones. So this expression is not as useful as this one is. You'll see why coming up. So we compared three and 11. Now let's compare three, this row three, which is our two with this three. The ones match up. We've got a one bit change. We've got a two bit. Two bits changing. That's not going to work. So we can't compare row three with row 13. Can we compare three with 14? Okay, we've got a zero and a one. There's a one bit change. No. There's another one bit change right here and here. So again, we've got a problem. We can't compare three with 14. Okay, continuing this pattern just a little bit more. We're done. We've exhausted comparing um, this two with the, the four possible threes. So now let's go on to our next two, which is right here. This is row five. Um, we can compare it with this three. There's a one bit change right there. So it's going to be zero, one, dash one. And I can read that off, 0, 1, dash 1, faster than I can read off not x, I mean not w, x, y, whatever. It's just easier to read this off. So now let's try to compare row 5 with row, um, what's the next 3 right down here? 11. Okay, a 1 and a 1 is okay. There's a change, there's a change. So I can't compare 5 with 11. That's why there's no 5 and 11 right here. And in a similar fashion, it looks like even though there's four possible 3s, each of these two rows only matches up with just two out of the four 3s. Okay, so the next step is to compare the 3s with the 4s. There's only one four, so let's just start right here. There's our four. Our first three 
is up here. So we're going to have a dash 111, dash 111. We're comparing row 7 with row 15. Now we can compare 15 with the next 3, which is 11. And it's going to be 1 dash 11. And then we can compare 13 and 15, and it's going to be a 1 1 dash 1. So this gets going pretty quick. And then our last row is 14 here. And that's going to be a 111 dash. Yes. So what have we done? We've basically circled all the two cell implicants in our Carnot map. And it looks like there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 of them. The next step is to combine all these two cell implicants into four cell implicants. So the way we do that is we first copy this table right here. So I've done that here. And then what we do is we start comparing rows again. Again, there just must be a one bit change and they must have a don't care in the same column. So let's look at the first row. It has a don't care there. We could combine it with row seven, but there's a two bit change. So we actually can't combine zero and seven. Going on down, we see we can combine it with 11, and there's just a one bit change, and that results in a dash dash one. So now we go on to the second row. There's the, the bit change, that's the first one. So can we compare it with uh, 3? No, nope, there's two bits of change. Can we compare it with 5? So 1 and 5. No, we can't. It's two bit change. How about 1 and 11? Yes. So we can commit, compare 1 and, I guess that's 10, not 11. It's 1 and 10, right? And we get the same thing. So we go on and do that for the rest of these. And we end up with five four-cell implicants, just like we did with the Carnot map when we did it by hand. So what we're going to do now is look for overlaps, look for prime implicants. So we've got the five right here. We're putting an X next in these rows, putting an X in these rows, where that implicant covers that don't care or covers that one. So YZ covers this don't care and it covers that one and it covers this don't care. In a similar fashion, XZ covers that don't care, covers that one, and covers. And what we end up with is a chart that shows us where the primes are. We look on these rows and where there's just one X, that means this is a prime. And this happens to cover both of those isolated ones. So WZ is a prime. And then we have this row just covered by WX and it covers the rest of these. So WX is prime. So we covered this one, this one, and all of these with just those two 4x4s. So all we're really left with is trying to cover this one. And we have three options. We can use either YZ, we can use XZ, or XY, which is exactly what we found with the Carnot map.